Father, we come before your throne today in anticipation of looking into your given word today. We ask, Lord, that you give us the wisdom to discern your message so that we can share it with others. We ask, Lord, that you give mercy to the sick as requests come in, Lord. We ask that you give them comfort. Pray for those who could. We ask that you bless all of us here today who are present and pray all of this in. So, anyway, uh. As I was saying, we're going to be looking in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Since we went over this in this study here, the Bible study with George. So you can grab your Bibles and I reflect uh, back on this past year. I'm inclined to believe that God we serve is a faithful God. And I'm of the persuasion and conviction that he is the sustainer and the maintainer of my entire life. He carried me through some dangers, seen and unseen. In fact, he's kept me even when I couldn't keep myself. He is an awesome God. You know that song? Our God is an With wisdom, strong power. See, God has never gone back on his word. As I look back, I can truly say, God is faithful. And because he is so faithful, because he is so awesome, requires us, his servants, to be faithful also. The word says, to whom much is given, much will be required. Believe is perhaps the greatest problem facing us today. This is a problem that I believe has plagued, infested, infected, and infiltrated the body of Christ, the church as a whole. Let me suggest to you that the greatest problem facing us is not the gang problem on the outside, not the drug pusher on the outside. Not the moral values of our youth, not the ungodliness, not the unrighteous, not darkness on the outside, not sin on the outside. The greatest problem facing us today is not what's going on on the outside, but what ain't going on on the inside. We may be doing everything in the church. God wants more. I believe that's what Paul is trying to tell us. We're moving in the anointing. Your services are flowing. Your membership is growing. Your programs are implemented. But he says here in the 12th chapter of Romans, God wants more. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Remember from the bodies, the Bible study, we went over that. Beseech you, it says. That word beseech is a term that means to call alongside, to come alongside, or to encourage. Paul says, I'm calling you to accountability now. It is a word that was used in the military circles that tells what happens when a military leader calls the soldiers to action. When the troops are on their way to war, the commander would call them together because they were preparing to do battle. That's the same term that's used here. Paul says, I'm calling you to attention. I'm calling you to come together, and I beseech you, I encourage you, I exhort you. I'm trying you to get you to see the urgency here about this. I plead with you. I'm encouraging you. I confront you. I challenge you. He says, I beseech you, therefore. Now, we've just come to what I want to call a spiritual stop sign. And we've got to stop. 
I beseech you therefore. The word therefore is a connecting word. And it's the key to the entire phrase or the, the entire verse. We must recognize that the word therefore means I said. And based on what I said, I'm getting ready to say something else. He said, I beseech you, therefore, and we can't go any further until we find out what the therefore is there for. Because the therefore is there for a reason. And unless we know what that therefore is there for, we won't understand what he is saying following the therefore. Because what he says following the therefore is based on what he said before he said the therefore. So let's see if we can discover what the therefore is there for. And I'm not going to repeat that three times either, just in case you were wondering. He says, and let me read this verse to you again. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I have discovered that there are three crucial therefores. Remember, therefore means I said. And based on what I said, I'm ready to say something else. So, if we were to outline this book, we'd find that the first crucial therefore is found in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. I want to skip to that, Romans chapter 5 verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the first crucial therefore. All that he said from chapters 1 in verse 1 to chapters 4 in verse 25 hinges on chapter 5 verse 1 where he says in Romans chapter 5 1 that the word justified is a legal term which means to be declared righteous. It means that we have been declared innocent. We have been declared righteous. We have been declared blameless. It is a term that is used in a court of law. Listen, I want you to paint this little picture in your head. Think about this with you now. You committed a crime and you've been hauled off the court of law. You see, we, are, we have all committed the crime of sin and have been found guilty. Romans 3.23 But God is the judge at our trial. And we have been given an attorney and John calls him an advocate. Someone to plead our case. And if you check his credentials, you will discover that he is none other than Jesus Christ himself. The son of the judge. And our attorney is there to plead our case. In fact, he not only pleads our case, but he is willingly takes our place and pays the penalty and covers us with his blood. So every time the judge looks at us, he sees our attorney Jesus, who stands in the front. He stands in the front of us, raising his hands in objection. When he raises his hands, you see the nail prints and where they pierced him in his side and where the blood came streaming down and it represents what he did on Calvary and he did that for you and even though all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and even though the wages of sin is death the gift of God is eternal life so when the judge sees the attorney standing before you and you are the defendant who was saved through the son he bangs his gavel and says I now declare you righteous I now declare you blameless 
not because of who you are, but because of your attorney, my son. And not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done for you. And therefore, you are justified by faith. We now come to the second crucial therefore in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Change to there. Romans chapter 8. He says, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In other words, although we are uncommitted, we are uncondemned. Because the penalty for our sin was paid by Jesus. And due to the fact that Jesus paid the penalty, God will not lay the, the uh, penalty and the punishment of sin on us. Let's look at what Isaiah said. Isaiah 53, chapter, uh, 53 verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. But, before you start to shout at me, look at this. The penalty of sin has already been paid. Therefore, you are no longer condemned. And since you are no longer condemned, you now have a responsibility to the one who has declared you righteous and declared you uncondemned. That leads us back to our text, which he says in verse 12, I mean in chapter 12, verse 1, Seek you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, based on what I've said, and based on the fact that you do deserve damnation, based on the fact that my son did stand in your place, based on the fact that you did stand before me guilty, based on the fact that my son took the penalty for you, based on the fact God has not given you what you deserve, based on the fact that you know that you are no longer condemned and based on all of that now I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice God says based on all that I have done you now have a responsibility he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. Now understand that when Paul uses the term brethren, he does not use it in the ethnic sense, but in a spiritual sense. Paul here is talking to people who have already been saved. He's speaking to church folk, just like you and me. Folks who have been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Folks who come to church and sing in the choir, serve on the usher board, pay their tithes. He's talking to folks that are already saved. But he challenges them to do something that they have not already done. You see, God is never interested in when you got saved, as he is with what you have done since you've been saved. God wants more. He's talking to folks that are already saved and he confronts them to do something that they have not already done. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies. In other words, You've already given me something, but you have not given me all I want. He's talking about discipleship. He's talking about total surrender. 
I beseech you, brethren, sistren, saints of God, to do something that you have not done already. And he says, I'm basing all of this on the mercies of God. Now, we've got to understand the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is God's unmerited favor. In other words, when God gives you what you don't deserve, then there's mercy on the other hand. Is when God doesn't give you what you do deserve. I'm going to give you an example of that. Daddy laid down the law. The child broke the law. That's us. Somebody had to clean it up. Daddy provided what it took to clean up the mess himself. That's justice. Daddy saw the tears of repentance on the child and didn't spank the child. That's mercy. Then took out the child for a treat. That's grace. Mercy is based on justification. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, God is saying, based on the fact that I'm not going to give you what you deserve, you deserve to lift your eyes in hell. You deserve weeping and gnashing of teeth. You deserve eternal damnation. You deserve eternal separation from me. You deserve eternal death. But because my son, Jesus, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve, and that's grace. I'm going to withhold what you do deserve. It's mercy. And based on the fact that I'm not going to give you what you do deserve, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, that you present your bodies. Let me stop here and pose this question. When was the last time you broke God's wall without your body? When was the last time you disobeyed God without your body? When he says, present to him your body, it means literally all that you are. Your body is an instrument of sin, your hands, your feet, but the challenge is that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. What does Paul mean by present? The word present is what I want to call a technical temple term. And when Paul said present, everybody automatically knew what he was talking about. The word present is a word that was used to describe what happens when you go to the temple to worship. You see, when you go to the temple, there was always a priest there. And the worshiper would come and take his offering or his sacrifice in his hand and then come before the altar and place or present his offering to the hand of the priest. It's a technical temple term. He places the offering in the hand. He comes before the priest and he places his offering in the hand of the priest. It's a technical temple term. What I'm trying to say is that there is a precise technical moment when you have presented. And before that precise technical moment, nothing you do qualifies as presenting. You show your offering in your hand. You come before the altar. You come before the priest. You place it in his hand. And then you have presented. In other words, if you have not presented, when you place your offering in your hand, you have not presented. When you come to the temple, you have not presented. When you place your offering in the hands of the priest, you only presented at the very technical point after you place the offering in your hand, after you come to the temple, after you stand before the altar, 
after you come before the priest and after you place the offering in the hand of the priest and then take your hand off it it is a technical temple term and until you reach the precise technical moment in which you place it in his hands and then take your hand off it you have not presented and until you place your body until you place your life, until you place your career, until you place your family, until you place your future, until you place your all, put it in the hands of God, and then you take your hands off it, you have not presented and you have not committed because God wants more. Coming to the temple or church right here, it's not enough. It does not matter how big your Bible is, even if it is baby got book. If you've not given him control, you're not committed. It does not matter how long you've been a member of the church. If you're still calling the shots in your life, you are not committed. It does not matter how much money you pay how sweet your song or how pretty your prayer if you're still calling the shots in your life and you have not taken your hands off it you are not committed and you have not presented yourself to the Lord coming to church on Sunday is not a commitment that's habit singing in a choir being an usher or a deacon is not a commitment. That's rehearsal. He says, I beseech you that you present. It means that you take your life and all that you have, place it in the hands of God, and then take your filthy hands off it, because God's calling the shots. God's making the decisions. God's in control. And anything less than that is not commitment because God wants more. There's that word holy in there. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy. Acceptable unto God which is your reasonable that means to set it aside for God's use, and God's use only. We need to understand that our body belongs to God, and it is sanctified, or set apart. And it is His property. Why? Because Paul says it is your reasonable service. The word reasonable comes from a Greek word called logikos which means logical by investigation. Paul was saying here, I'm calling you to present your body to the Lord. That is your reasonable service. He says, I have investigated it. And it's logical. In other words, that it makes sense. Well, Paul, why does it make sense? Why is it so logical? You have investigated it. You have checked it out. And the result of your analysis is that it just makes sense. But Paul, why is it so logical that I give my all to God? The answer is found in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 verse 19 says what do you do or what do you do <laughs> what do you not that your body do you know not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you whom you have from God and you are not your own for you were brought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's so Paul is telling us, when God says to us that 
we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, it means that it makes sense simply because when you give yourself to God, giving him back what's already his, he already owns it. He's saying that we ought to do that because we belong to God. In fact, we're his twice because he made us and he knows all about us and because he paid for us when he sent his son, Jesus, to die on Calvary. And he says, what I'm trying to say is that You've got to present your body as a living sacrifice to be used of God because you belong to Him. All that you have, all that you are, belongs to Him. But I hear somebody saying, Well, God, what are you going to do with my hands? What are you going to do with my feet? How do you want to use me in your service? The Bible says, You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. The word witness is, is also a legal term. That talks about what happens in a court of law. It's when you get on the witness stand, you put your hand on the Bible, and the clerk says, Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Everybody remember that? Someone says, I want to be a witness. I want to testify about what I heard. I heard he was born of a virgin named Mary. I heard he came down through 42 generations. I heard they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. I heard they laid him in a manger. But when you start testifying about what you heard, the devil says, Objection! Objection! That testimony is not admissible in this court. Because what you heard is hearsay. Can I get another witness? Solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Somebody says, I want to testify about what I believe. I believe he healed the sick. I believe he raised the dead. I believe he walked on water one day. I believe he stopped deaf ears. I believe he made the blind to see. I believe he told Lazarus to come forth one day. I believe they lied on him and accused him. I believe they put an old rusty cross on his back and marched him up Golgotha's hill. I believe they put nails in his hands and his feet. I believe they placed a crown of thorns on his head. I believe they put a spear in his side. I believe he hung there from the sixth to the ninth hour. I believe he hung his head and gave up his ghost. I believe they put him in a tomb. I believe he stayed there all night Friday and all day Saturday and all night Saturday. I believe early Sunday morning with all power, all the power in his hands. But when you start testifying about what you believe, the devil says, objection. That testimony is not admissible in this court because what you believe is conjecture. Now can I get another witness? Is there anybody here as a testimony for the Lord? Take the stand and be a witness. Stand and be a witness for you solemnly swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth. Somebody says, I want to testify. I don't want to talk about what I heard, because that's just hearsay. I don't want to talk about what I believe, because that's just conjecture. 
but I've got a testimony. And I want to testify about what I know. There's somebody here who knows what God has done for them. Want to stand up and be a witness. I don't know what he's done for you. And because he's done so much, I hear him saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. No matter what life may bring, all you have to do is turn it over to Jesus, because he can work it out. God, as we leave here today, allow us the strength and the endurance to pray your will and bring good news to those who will listen. Father, we thank you for being here with us today. We also thank you, Lord, for know you will never leave or forsaken us. We pray that you can be your shepherds, that we can be your shepherds and bring in the lost sheep so that they can be comforted and find a way to your harvest. We pray for the war victims around the world. We pray for all those who were lost in the Torosami in Japan, Japanese, their country. We pray this in his name. The Holy Spirit illuminated child of God knows that he has received mercy from God. Therefore, he wants to make biblical sacrifices. You know, we just went over Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. And it gives a clear instructions on how to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And this is another version of it. This was taken from the, the national version. It says, Therefore I urge you, bro, do of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and this is your spiritual act of worship to conform any longer to the pattern of this world transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good pleasing. The promises of scripture regarding the suffering Savior teach us that God will raise up a people who will proclaim the truths of Christ. There are three heart desires found in the child of God's life that enable him to be a witness for Jesus Christ. The first is the desire to have an undefiled mouth. Isaiah wrote of Jesus Christ, He had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus taught that speech as a whole is a reflection of who man really is. Jesus said, make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. A tree is recognized by its fruit. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. For by your mouths, or I'm sorry, for you, by your words, you will be acquitted, and your words will be found in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Speech is that predominantly true, proper, chaste, instructive, and righteousness proves that the heart is right before God. Speech is often false, envious, malignant, and unrighteous proves that the heart is wrong. Words that we speak as a whole show forth the fruit that is inside our heart, just as we can, can know the tree by the fruit it bears. A sinful heart produces sinful speech in a heart controlled by the Holy Spirit of Christ, dominantly produce speech that is pleasing to the Lord. Guess what? Holy Spirit has a question for you right now. Anybody want to hear it? It says, does your speech 
proclaim the gospel. Thank everyone for coming. Thank everyone.